this. I mean, this room actually turns out to be a phenomenal video conferencing fa facilities. If it works, um, there will be microphones put on every table, and then the whoever you want to speak, you just press the little button, and the camera actually will go. It's actually sound sensitive. It goes around to who's ever speaking. So this is the cyber room. Now, the only problem with this, I hate to say it, is the University of Toronto. Our system is too good for them, actually. They did a hookup, and they only have two 56K lines running out of the room that they're in. And as Patrick said, well, the problem is this is like a real cyber system here, and you don't even register. We don't go that low. We don't get downgraded to that point. So I think that Marshall McLuhan himself would like this a lot, because Marshall McLuhan, as part of his thesis in the book Understanding Media, was that you know the potentiality of a technological society is that every uh, margin is potentially a real center, and so I think you know with respect to the Canadian university system, you know U of T might think of Concordia as marginal because it likes to think of itself with American universities, but it turns out when you go to cyber systems, I mean uh, Concordia University in the, like in this room is really far ahead of most places. So I thought, well, McLuhan would like this very much. The margins become sort of the cyber star, actually. So it's good. So we're going to see if we can get our systems downgraded sufficiently to pick out the U of T. Otherwise, they're going to be expelled from this, the technological system from cyber culture. So I hope it works anyway. But it would be really interesting, because Derek's such a really innovative, interesting thinker. And his students I've met, are, or some of them I've met, and they're really great as well. Uh, Ted suggested that I just talk to you very briefly about the, not the exam for, you know, the test for next week. Did you, would you started working on the questions? And how's it going? Agony, do I hear sighs of lament and agony? Seem reasonable, the questions and stuff? Hmm? All the human, inhumanity? <laughs> well, so that's due next week. And I thought what we'd do next week is do something different. What I like to do is just come in, if you come in during the first part of the class and um, just hand in the assignment, okay? So just give me the assignment. And it can't be any later than that unless you have a doctor's excuse, just to make it sort of fair for everyone. And then I will be here. Won't, we won't have a regular class, but I'll stay here during the whole class period because I'd like to talk to you about the paper assignments. No sooner you get finished one than another one sort of starts up. Uh, it's to make sure that everyone, uh, just we have a sort of a chance to talk. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about the paper itself, which is, if I could ever find the silly, oh, it's done on both sides. It says, um, I'll just read what it says. It's the, this is not the uh, test for next week, which is the take home. And I don't even think of it as like a sort of a test. View it as like a, you know, just really a chance to reflect on the readings that we've been doing and sort of like summarize your own thinking on the readings. And there's really no correct or incorrect answers in this at all. They're just really levels, the quality of the answer and the degree of reflection that you bring to bear. But the paper itself is a little different, okay? Because the paper, you can either work individually or you can work in groups. But no matter how you work, I like to talk to everyone before you start really get into writing the paper. Just, just in case I can give you some suggestions about books or suggestions about uh, you know, just the topic that you've chosen. Develop a project or a research topic that clarifies, you know, the, you know this is a class like in media technology and politics, so that clarifies the, the political context of technology and understanding that since really, really generally. That is the relationship like we've been discussing of technology to class, to issues what? Of gender and class, sexuality, colonization, identity, surveillance, terrorism, anthrax scares. I mean, you can just, if you ask the question of technology today, you're implicitly will be involved in a political discussion in the broad sense of a political discussion itself. The topic should be discussed with myself can focus on writing exclusively if you like, because some people I know in the class work with multimedia, and you can do a combination paper of multimedia presentation, and you can do writing. But no matter what you do, you have to do some writing. Writing is really sort of an important art of technology, and allows you to do sort of a reflection on the technology itself. And I just put the length as, you know, 10 to 12 pages, and that's not like a firm link. You shouldn't go any less than that. And if you have something you really want to write, it's going to go longer, that's fine as well. So it's not hard and fast, but I just want to make it just sort of it's a manageable length for you. And it's due on November 7th. So that's why I'd like to talk to you by next week because November 7th is not all that far away. Okay, and I know that you know, the school year is always compressed and I don't have to tell you that and stuff. Is that any questions on that? Okay, so that's that. And now, just before coming to class, I checked out Google. Do you know Google has this new news service? 
my all-time absolute favorite news service. It's done by machines. All it does is that you go on Google, press new, and Google sends its machines around and they report the news as of one minute ago, five minutes ago, one hour ago. And it's simply done by search engines which troll all the headlines of the world and then take, you know, do a statistical frequency of topic and then whatever has the highest frequency of topic for certain subject matter then gets reported as news. So I thought, well, this is really in itself like a media event that's happening. And so just before class, this article came up, which actually isn't even in the past, this is in the future, it's datelined October the 10th, it's from Korea. So it said 10 minutes ago, I said, what, 10 minutes into the future or something of the sort. And it's sort of, it's a really sad story. It says, Korean man dies after computer games binge. A 24-year-old South Korean man died after playing computer games nonstop for 86 hours, police said. <laughs> the jobless man, identified by police only by his last name, Kim, was found dead yesterday at an internet cafe in Kwonji, 265 kilometers southwest of Seoul, they said. Quoting witnesses, police detectives said the man had been virtually glued to the computer since late last Friday and had no decent sleep and meals. He collapsed in front of the counter early yesterday and regained consciousness was later found dead, an autopsy was planned. So I thought, wow, that she just comes over the net and it's a story, sort of humorous, but at the same time it's like so laced with pathos and degradation and sadness itself, you know. So in terms of um, a media event itself, it's like one of these kind of, incom it's like a technological event, it's like incommensurable. It's like technological obsession to the point of dying in computer games itself. And then the kind of anonymous search engine goes around and sort of turns the story coming out of Korea and reports it as 10 minutes ago and then it sort of spills over the net for one blip of media attention on the net and then the machines keep turning and then another story comes out, out again. But then you're sort of left with the fact, well, what does technological obsession mean? What does it mean playing a computer game it's for 86 hours to the point of exhaustion itself? And is his playing computer games any real different than like, uh, people at Wired Magazine who used to tell me that they would revel in the fact that in the early days of Wired Magazine that they would be at their computers, they would actually collapse. They said they just worked to the point of exhaustion and they had kept their sleeping bags right below their computer workstations and then they'd fall asleep and bring their cats in and feed their cats and things like this. And they wouldn't even leave to go eat because they said they were brought foods in sort of like aluminum trays and they would keep eating. So I said, well, could this be technological obsession, you know, which is reported through Wired magazine itself. And speaking of which, it was very interesting. There was an article, a technological article among many good ones in the New York Times this week, which said that people who are resisting, like Steve Mann in Toronto, Cyberman in Toronto's resisting surveillance systems, have found a very easy way to resist those ubiquitous computer surveillance, those ubiquitous surveillance cameras which is, you know, those little pin, pin lights you can take with little infrared, Therese, little red infrared lights going on. All you have to do, it turns out, is just take one of them and flash them at a surveillance camera and you'll momentarily blind the camera itself. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good technique and I can see that sort of catching on, sort of ubiquitous and would become like sort of an equipment that you carry as sort of like your dataware. But then I noticed that Kevin Kelly from Wired Magazine immediately seeing in fact there might be a hole in the system, put out a news release on behalf of Wired Magazine that says, this is like a, I'm paraphrase, this is a naughty, naughty thing to do because these surveillance systems have been erected for our own public safety and you're interfering in public safety. I thought, well, this is, there's a lot of ideology here, a lot of discussion that needs to take place maybe about you know, surveillance systems, are they providing freedom or surveillance systems actually have something to do with surveillance, with actually domination. And what is the role of resistance in, with respect to surveillance? And if you do resist, are you then closing down the opportunities for others to have safety? You know, this is a promise like in Britain with the highest degree, I think, believe the highest density of surveillance cameras really in the world in their urban areas. And the British government says that these, surve excuse me, these surveillance cameras are really necessary because it really ensures public safety. If you're a woman going out in the streets, you can be sure that the street that you're never going to be alone in Cyber City in some ways. Yes? Speaking of Steve Mann, I just wanted to read this. A Times article was reporting today that an American scientist or professor had just invented the world's first portable computer, wearable computer. Um, I don't know many of the details of that. Maybe you No. So is it in the Gazette or on the... No, right. I heard it on the radio. It's just somebody, it's an American professor that had just invented a new game, the first one that was wearable computer. And 
wow, th that couldn't be true. <laughs> no, because the wearable computers have been around for quite some time. And one of the f real first inventors of it was Steve Mann at the University of Toronto. Yeah. Why, if we had some way of pirating the system, we would immediately put a retraction on immediately. <laughs> okay, we won't. Maybe at the break, okay? <laughs> yes? Did you have your hand up? Okay, yeah, that's a really interesting story, yeah. But uh, Steve Mann's, you know, the wearable computer guy, I can imagine he's probably making a patent infringement thing already on this and stuff like this. Okay. Let's, that's oh, fine. So let's, uh, let me immediately go into the article I want to discuss this week, which is Donna Haraway's article, A Cyborg Manifesto. Has everybody read a cyborg manifesto? Let's take a rough count. You can nod and I'll promise anonymity. Just so we sort of know where we stand. Maybe, you've, how many have read it for sure? Full uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the salient points. <laughs> this is not true confessions. <laughs> okay. okay, how many? <laughs> well, that's a harder question, really. <laughs> have absorbed it, yeah. Well, okay, so let's, let me just go through some of the main, like very briefly, go through some of the main points in Cyborg Manifesto, and then we can discuss it. Then I think if uh, Patrick comes in and says that we, in fact, have a cyber connect with the University of Toronto, then that class there, would there they know that we're discussing Haraway's The Cyborg Manifesto, and then maybe we can have like a sort of a cyber conversation between the two classes. We'll see if it actually works. These things never work, but we can, <laughs> we valiantly, <laughs> you, don't, you don't believe these will work. Oh, it's surreal. Well, it is sort of surreal, but they actually. Yeah, no, I know it's true. It's delirious, actually, <laughs> and particularly when it doesn't work, because you then immediately have to talk about downgraded cyborgs, sort of in some ways, and so the whole context sort of flies in the face of Donna Haraway's thesis in a cyborg manifesto, you know, right where she says from the start, you know, she says at the at the conclusion of this, but it could be the beginning of this. She said, you know, in talking about her you know, relationship to technology, speaking from a woman's perspective and interested in feminism, she says, you know, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. And it strikes me as really interesting because the article moves on like so many different fronts because she really wants to talk like a, you know, create, I would say, is like a new mythology of women's experience in technoculture itself. And she, has, she says she wants to create like a sort of an iconic dream an iconic dream for a common language of a kind of iconic dream of a common language for women in what she calls the integrated circuit. And this article, of course, was originally published in her really famous book, which she wrote in what, 91, in the early 90s, Simeon, Cyborgs, and Women, the Reinvention of Nature Nature. And this article in the Cyborg Manifesto is just, you know, there's certain few articles which are just massively influential. And this article has just been massively influential on in any number of different fronts. It's influential because it really stated a very, in a very original way, really different kind of feminism with respect to technoculture itself. I mean, not for Donna Haraway. She's like the article begins like with a refusal of two other forms of feminism. It begins with an immediate refusal of a kind of reduction of what Donna Haraway would call like a reductionist feminism. You know, like Catherine McKinnon's notion that sexual politics would be based on what she would describe in this as an, as that an essential human identity. That in fact there's something about a woman's experience or about feminism that has about it sort of like an, a, you know, an essential quality as a human experience itself or an essential form of identity. And Donna Haraway is not a reductionist. She in fact is really much, she's a traitor to that because later in the article she's going to say, well if we're going to talk about you know, a women's identity today, we can't really go back nostalgically to the notion of an essential women's identity. It should, we should really take into account the actual material situation in which women's experience, in which guys' experience is to be found. And that is the actual experience in with which, within which we all live is what she calls an informatics of domination, an informatics of domination. So on that basis, she says, really, rather than go back to an essentialist idea of human identity, in which you sort of think about like an automatic feminine experience, why don't we do something a bit more complex? Why don't we say that women's experience and men's experience is really shaped by the codes 
which we experience. And then this article proceeds to say that there are two big code machines which are driving us all. One code machine is the fact that we're caught up always in these sort of these tight feedback loops in, you know, the, in the image system and, you know, sort of like this, you know, we sort of drift in sort of like the dreamscape of a cybernetic system in which we're sort of not like the beginning of it and we're not the end of it, but we're sort of like a relay point and it fills us with imaginations and sort of wires our brains, feeds us kind of crises. I mean, just I can't get off out of my mind the fact that it's like this what a really surrealistic experience it is to, you know, as this class goes on to we live week after week with, you know, like anthrax scares one day, snipers in Washington the next, worrying about Saddam Hussein trying to make up my own mind as he actually was Bush correct that Saddam Hussein's like a Cuban missile crisis that he's actually threatening direct delivery of biological and nuclear weapon systems against the United States relatively poor society that claim has never been made. And yet that feeds back into the cyber loop. I watched a talk show the other evening in which it was a talk show of women. And the women were there talking about Saddam Hussein. The conversation came around to that. And one woman said just immediately, taken into her voice, it was like listening to the spokesman for the present administration in Washington who said exactly the same thing. She says, why bullets are cheap. If we just had a bullet, we could get rid of the guy and that would be much cheaper. I thought, oh, I've heard that before. And of course, he'd heard that. You know, I'd heard that several days before when the Bush administration official spokesman came out, and that's exactly what he said. So I was thinking of Donna Haraway when I said that. And it, that's a Donna Haraway's point that we're caught up in these kind of tight feedback loops in which, you know, like there's, you know, like very new definitions of the public situation. Who's to be scapegoated? Who's the enemy? Who's the friend? Or just don't play at media systems any longer but they enter really deeply into our subjectivity and into our brains and into our emotions itself. So the very notion of what constitutes a media needs to really be rethought. And Donna Haraway begins the notion of rethinking the media. She says, we live within the integrated circuit. We live within the integrated circuit. She says the machinery today is a machinery of microelectronics. We live in the integrated circuit, cir circuits. And the notion of the cyborg today is not simply these big cinematic Hollywood machines, half flush, half metal, you know, like Terminator, which are sort of somewhere outside of ourselves. She says cyborgs, in fact, are something very different. We are cyborgs. She says if you live in the integrated circuit, if you live in a culture of microelectronics, if your cell phone has DSP, high intensity, high velocity signal processors within that, if you pick up, you know, which transmit calls and which can make the line have a little hiss to make it sort of sound more real as opposed to hyper real. If you live in a culture in which the act of having a cell phone by next year will mean that you in fact can be tracked and targeted by in fact those who control, you know, the informatics of domination. If your imagination is being played over and your feelings are being played over continuously by the, inter the systems of the integrated circuit within which we live, then Donna Haraway would say it's time to stop thinking about cyborgs as these kind of cinematic machinery outside of ourselves and say, well, maybe our subjectivity today is cybernetic, that we are cyborgs, that we are part of the electronic circuit, of this microelectronic circuit itself. So on this basis, Donna Haraway then says, well, as a woman speaking about this, you know, this, the fact that I am a cyborg, in actual real material fact, and that my work experience is framed by what she calls the informatics of domination means, in fact, that I have to think of the fact that today, you know, boundaries that before I could take for granted have become very fluid and porous and permeable. That I can't be confident any longer of speaking about what's the relationship between my body and nature. What's the relationship between my body and machinery itself? She says, in fact, the boundaries have been blurred. Boundaries have been broken. And perhaps we need to speak about ourselves as sort of like, you know, sort of half flesh and half data and sort of half animals and half humans. That the boundaries themselves have become porous and permeable and fluid. That we have become cyborgs. So in this basis, Donna Haraway is speaking from a very political point of view. Because she thinks of herself, you know, when she's writing this article and her position since then has changed. But she writes this article from the position of being a socialist feminist. And she said, on this basis, I can't think of my identity any longer 
as essentialist. She says, because my identity doesn't have anything essential from it, it's not fixed. It's in fact really changing and really porous and really fluid. I am living in the codes and I need to learn how to navigate the codes. And if I'm going to have a satisfactory identity, I'm going to have to find out how to navigate the codes and how to create, you know, like a space of freedom within an informatics of domination. So she refuses then, like, one form of feminism, which she would say is too reductive. It talks about, like, almost an automatic form of feminism by virtue of the fact that you're a woman. Secondly, she refuses implicitly another kind of feminism, which I think is really well worth reading. She refuses a form of feminism that's called uh, New French Feminism. And New French Feminism is just fabulous writers. Hélène Sixieu, Lucia Rigere, Julia Kristeva. I mean, really, if you're interested in feminism, you should go read these writers. If you haven't read them, you should really read them. And there's a, actually a textbook, not a textbook, but a book of readings put out, translating in English, called New French Feminisms, which you might want to get. Because the writings in that, when I read that, it just changed my life. I think because it wasn't just the content of the writing, it was in fact the radical quality of the writing itself, where thinkers like Lucia Regeri and Hélène Sixieu and Julia Kristeva said really what they were set out to do was to, you know, sort of break the, like, break the veil, break the silence of like a male stream culture in which women's identity could never be, and subjectivity could never be talked about and could never be thought about in their own terms. And the way that they said that they were going to set out to do this was through the act of writing itself. They said, let us begin to write a woman's body. Let us begin to write a woman's experience. And it'll be a form of writing which comes out of the immense violence and immense centuries of repression itself. But it will be a form of writing which itself will be porous and fluid. And you won't really know where the body begins and ends. Now, when Donna Harway begins this article, you know, she doesn't want that either, really. You know, because she says this type of writing, implicitly says this type of writing is like too focused on the notion of a woman's body, too focused on the act of writing itself. And Harway then moves back to saying, well, we need to really reflect on a woman's body, a human being's body, in the context of a real material conditions, of an informatics of domination. So she refuses that as well. And that's a refusal I think is really sad, actually. I just really urge you, if, do you know, have you read Julia Kristeva and Lucia Rigre and Alain Sixieu, New French Feminism? Never heard of such a thing? Phenomenal. Well, then you, you have a wonderful moment of pleasure in your life coming up. When you go to the library sometime, if you just would pick up this text, though, that's called the trans series of translations, takes a lot of the writings and bring them together. It's simply called New French Feminisms. And I think Curtivion, C-O-U-R-T-I-V-L-L-O-N, I think. I'm not sure that's correct. It's one of the editors. I'll get you the exact citation. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal text. The writing itself is really beautiful. And the writing itself is just, you know, there's a before that writing and there's an after that writing. But that's sort of off Haraway a little bit. Because Haraway, you know, sort of situates herself as sort of between these two perspectives. And because she's much more interested in one, speaking about a woman's experience in actual material reality. She says, let's talk about women's experience in terms of like the workplace, in terms of ideological and political relationships with the state, in terms of medicine. And let's talk about that kind of real contradiction of a global culture in which global culture ironically is being feminized, in which she says work is being feminized. And by that she means that work that used to be the condition of women, which is to say part-time part -time work uh, oftentimes unpaid or very ill-paid, uh, fragmentary, you're in the workforce, then there's a little recession, you're out of the workforce, fragmentary work. She says what used to be the con material condition of women in a globalized workplace has been become the condition for everyone as the economy itself gets dispersed around the world and in which there's like a strict separation between sites of high consumption like in North America and sites of cheap labor and often children's labor in third and fourth world, so-called third and fourth world countries around the world itself. So Harway, you know, her focus in this article is squarely on the informatics of domination. And when she says the word cyborg, she's thinking in two really different terms about it. She's thinking about it in terms of a utopian terms. You know, she says in the notion 
of life in the integrated circuit, there is the possibility to create a new women's identity, porous and fluid. It doesn't have to be based on you know, the old fixed down categories of gender or race or colonization. It's a real possibility for using you know, globalized technological experience to create new forms of women's identity. But at the same time as she says that, she says the reality of the way in which cyborg culture is delivered to us, the way in which we experience an informatics of domination is just really tight repression and tight kind of oppressive control. We are in fact alienated from our own experience. We in fact are, have fractured identities. Our boundaries might have been broken down, but we have to ask the question, well, who's programming the codes? Who's writing the script? Whose play, really, whose kind of media play are we within? Do we author our own codes, or in fact, are we sort of like passively coded by others? And Haraway's perspective on the informatics of domination is that we have really left an, an industrial culture and moved into a culture of the integrated circuit into a cybernetic culture, and, but it has a very old politics about it. And the politics is really old because it's a politics of top-down kind of repression. It's really fractured identities itself. So the article begins, you know, in that great tradition of writing, it begins with a blasphemy. You know, it sort of breaks things apart. It said the image of the cyborg, it's everywhere. It's in science fiction, it's in medicine, it's in finance, it's in communication. Boundaries have broken down. We live with fractured identities. The cyborg appears in myth precisely when the boundary between the human and animals are transgressed. So the radical question appears, what's an organism today? What is the meaning of a human being today? And what is the meaning of the post-human? What's the meaning of a machine today? Are machines something outside of ourselves, or do machines sort of slipstream their way inside human bodies itself? And what's consciousness? And what's code? And are codes something simply that computer programmers write? Or are there codes of technology which are given to us in the language of the media? And are there even deeper codes, like the film that we saw last week after Darwin, which in fact is about a code of life itself? And who's writing the new reproductive codes of life, the new genetic codes? Who controls them? Like when you saw the film after Darwin, could you really have any confidence that in fact these codes and the writings of the new reproductive codes for the human species are completely under our control? Or is something else happening? Then in fact we begin to slip into sort of a screen in which codes are written by other people or ourselves. So Harway's thesis, the beginning of this, is that we're living in a mythic time, a time of shimras and zombies and cyborgs. And it's a mythic time because we ourselves have become hybrids of machines and organisms. It's our politics and it's also our imagination. And she says at the same time, she says at the same time that we live within, if we become like self-conscious cyborgs, then we simultaneously are opened up to much greater domination, to an informatics of domination. But at the same time, if we stay faithful to the notion of the cyborg, there's something really liberatory in that concept. And it's liberatory in that concept, she says, because you can skip the step of the original unity. Skip the step of the original unity. Skip the step of thinking that there's these automatic divisions and you're automatically condemned to belong to a certain gender, to a certain race, to have a certain identity. She says, if you're a feminist and you're a cyborg, then you also will be committed to irony, to partiality, to intimacy, to perversity. To perversity. This is on page 293. You'll be committed to partiality, irony, intimacy, to perversity itself. In other words, Donna Haraway is saying, that if we are living within the integrated circuit, we immediately, in ways that we probably not even aware of, are having codes written for us. And our experience is coded at the digital level and at the biotechnological level, at a biogenetic level. At the same time, how do you resist those codes? I mean, how do you resist the informatics of domination? And she has really a radical suggestion. She says, be cyborg. 
go faster than the technological system or go slower than it. Think, in fact, of yourself as sort of a code breaker and a code writer. What does a cyborg do? A cyborg begins to swim within the informatics of domination. And it finds ways of negotiating you know, the domination of the informatics of domination by irony, by paradox, by perversion, by intimacy. It begins to break the rules while not denying the reality within which it finds itself. So let's just see if I can just see. Donna Harway says this so on page 293. She says, the relationship for forming holes from parts, including those of polarity and hierarchical domination, are at issue in the cyborg world. Unlike the hopes of Frankenstein's monster, the cyborg does not expect, this is page 293, does not expect its father to save it through a restoration of the garden. So there goes the myth of the good old garden, and there goes good old daddy as well. That is through this fabrication of a heterosexual mate, through its completion in a finished whole, a city or a cosmos. The cyborg doesn't dream of community on the model of the organic family, this time without the readable project. You know, the readable project of mummy, daddy, me. The cyborg breaks the Oedipus wide apart. The cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden. The cyborg is not made of mud and can't dream of returning to dust. Perhaps that is why I want to see if cyborgs can subvert the apocalypse of returning to nuclear dust in the manic compulsion to name the enemy. Cyborgs are not reverent. They don't remember the cosmos. They're wary of holism, you know, like holism, like these constructions of totalities. But they're needy for connection. They seem to have a natural feel for united front politics, but without the vanguard party. The main trouble with cyborgs, of course, is that they are the illegitimate offspring of militarism and of patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. So cyborgs are born in sin, sort of, for Donna Harway. They're not born in an age of innocence. They're not, I'll just finish this one sentence. They're not born out of an age of the Garden of Eden and out of the myth of like some place that you can return to. Donna Harway says cyborgs are born they're the offspring of an informatics of domination. They're born out of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. But illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. Their fathers, after all, are inessential. Their fathers are inessential. So really, Donna Harway's article really begins with blasphemy and sort of a call to cyber arms. And it's not just an analysis of an informatics of domination, but saying, in fact, that there is another way of thinking technology which simultaneously breathes in deeply the language of technology. It says, yes, we're born of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, and depending on where you are in the world of state socialism. Or there's a new wonderful book out by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, a book called Empire, which you might have put out by Harvard University Press. And the book Empire begins with a thesis very similar to this. It says empire is really the development of like a universal and homogenous state, which is put in place by militarism and which is fully capitalist. And at the same time as you have an empire emerging, which is to say globalization, then the form of resistance to it, these authors claim, is what they say is the development of the multitude, diverse points of resistance like you know, the student resistors in Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square in China, or the Zapatistas working out of Mexico, or the uh, warrior society, and the, which is going on yesterday, for example. Someone sent me an email uh, last evening uh, from the warrior society, which is the indigenous warrior society in British Columbia, reporting what doesn't, get, doesn't really get reported in the press, as far as I can see that in fact the RCMP has been going around Port Alberni in British Columbia, smashing in doors, roasting uh, Aboriginal families out of their houses, supposedly looking for arms. The real crime of these people seems to be that the Warrior Society has been very militant in defense of indigenous fishing rights on the coast of British Columbia. And they're called, uh, labeled by the state, terrorists. 
And as one person, one woman, the mother of a child who's taken out and she asked the RCMP, she says, um, is it a crime now to resist the state? He said, oh, it'd be very, very sad if your child grew up without a mother. So that, well, that's his, you know, really talking about state terrorism, other terrorisms, you know, who's writing the codes? Who gets to code people as terrorists? You know, what is the real play of power itself? Well, Donna Haraway, you know, you know, anticipating the logic of a book like Empire, says really we live in this kind of complex situation in which the world really has radically changed from industrialism to the integrated circuit to an age of globalization. And that age of globalization provides its own conditions for resistance. And in this book, Empire, by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, they say the multitude is much like Christianity in the days of the Roman Empire. That Christianity actually took over the Roman Empire not by doing away with the empire, but by providing the empire with a radically different moral content. And so they look over the political resistances, particularly student movements, in Genoa and Quebec City and Vancouver, and say that in these student movements, in these singular moments of intense resistance, are also to be found languages of like a new moral content for the age of the empire itself. And I think that book written after the Cyborg Manifesto, these are similar themes. Because Donna Harway is something, saying something very close to that. She's saying the notion of the cyborg might come out of the language of globalization, but it has a different, radically different moral content. It's charged, you know, it's a really radically different moral content, and it has the possibility of doing something because it has armed itself with the language of technology. It's partial, it's ironic, it's intimate, it's perverse. We are cyborg. It's a cyborg manifesto. I'm sorry. Feminism. She does. And as you said before, she virtually removes herself and essentially well, tries to. Tries to. Yeah. Yet she paints a, an extremely essentialist portrait of what a cyborg is. It's a very categorical and physically designated slug. So she removes herself from the central feminist slug and portrays herself as essentially an, an essentialist feminist. That's really nice. That's just a really good comment. Do you think the her notion of a, a cyborg though is essentialist? And you have to be part of this, um, this, this category, this list of things to be just because a cyborg, but at the same time she declares that everyone's a cyborg. Uh, no, she doesn't declare everyone's a cyborg. But she says, you know, I have to find it, but she says that, you know, when, that, that we're all these hybrid little machines. Yeah. She recognizes that there's no clear distinction between <coughs> what a cyborg is, but as the, in, in her own issue, she declares that there's no clear line anymore and that we're all some kind of hybrids, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's a really good comment. Do you think do you think that it's possible that that her notion that I mean it's a really good argument to say in fact that she's you know s separated herself from essentialist feminisms and now she's speaking about but she immediately returns essentialism, you know, language of a fixed position to the notion of the cyborg itself. Mm -hmm. But do you think somehow in her notion of a cyborg is something that really fights against essentialism? Be until the point where she kind of classifies it. I mean, the cyborg must be very withholding. It's not just a hybrid of man and machine, but someone who also can take a philosophical position on things, which, which is essential. It's true. It's true. Do you think, it, but, but the very basis of a cyborg in Haraway's description is that it's, it has, it's, it's an impossibility. Because there's two things that are going on, at, at two tendencies at one and the same time. Because in her description, like if you go to like page 300 and 301 when she describes the informatics of domination, mm -hmm. well, there's a description of an informatics of domination which she says the cyborg is like two impossible things at one and the same time and it's sort of like a struggle. It's like a wound that's kept open. On the one hand, it, you know, it's like born almost you know, be drawn into holism. It's born as part of a globalized economy. And its definition of self is given as like a you know, it's like sort of a stamped, coded identity, which is imprinted upon it, is given us, you know, what a philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre would call a serial identity, you know, language of domination. 
But the cyborg, the other side of the cyborg is in fact struggling against being, you know, like drowned in that holistic globalized identity. Let me just give a practical example. Like one way of being cyborg today is to be a consumer. That's just, you know, th most business culture doesn't think of human beings. They think of people as consumers. And you know, the marketing strategies are set up on that basis. And it would be it's very easy in the culture in which we live to find yourself identifying with that definition. Because it's very difficult to sort of escape a consumer relationship. And the language permeates everything. Permeates book culture. I know like editors now, they don't talk about readers any longer. They talk about consumers. And they're producing the product, and the product's the book. Happens in education, like digital education is about how many info consumers can you have for product you know, deliverers, knowledge delivery system deliverers. That's teachers, such as myself, and things like this. So that's like the, you know, like the holistic notion of consumption gives you like an identity. So that's one part of being cyborg. But another part of being cyborg, if you're not going to be you know, dominated, is in fact to struggle against that. And Haraway would just say that the struggle against consumption doesn't really begin with, can't begin in a context outside consumption. It begins just with the realities of how we find ourselves. And so how do you begin to negotiate a difference in your identity? How do you become like a, how do you go beyond being labeled a consumer in a culture driven mad with consumption? And there are various positions that people take. Some people go to ascedia, the old practice of ascedia. That is, they go on like a consumption diet sort of like starve themselves. Or some people would you know, begin to parody systems of consumption, like Dutch resistance groups, for example, are always doing sort of actions in supermarkets and stores in which they go in and they just parody the act of consumption itself. Like the book, uh, the group that actually, you know the book Fight Club? Chuck Palahniuk's book, Fight Club? Well, the group that that was based on was actually, that's actually based on a real group called Fight Club. It comes out of Seattle on the west coast of the United States. And one of the actions the Fight Club would, uh, did, one of their great actions, was uh, one hot July day, about 50 of them all dressed up as Santa Claus. And they're in San Francisco. Then they all booked the, the same flight. This wouldn't, not, well, obviously wouldn't happen right now. And so these 50 Santa Clauses got on this flight that went up to Seattle or went up to Portland. I think it was to Portland. And then they went to Portland's major store as Santa Clauses, and they went right into the toy section. And they all found toys they liked, and then they began giving them out to the children, saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. And it sort of caught the security guards into the store, you know, sort of by surprise. What are you going to do with Santa? Your icon, Santa Claus, is giving away all your goods in your store. So I would say that's sort of, you know, the kind of actions that people do when they're, like, that's being a cyborg. Because that's really operating within the language of consumption, but turning its own logic against itself. They got on the plane, then they disappeared, waiting for another action. The west coast of the United States and in the deserts of America, you get like really interesting kind of political actions, which are really theatrical and parodic and creative, just as the same way that you do in the streets of Montreal in terms of political actions. Like what, uh, just what about uh, two years ago, for example, I was downtown in Montreal and I saw what I thought was like Montreal postmodernism, which is rather than have a kind of event where the cops surround the students and beat everyone's head in and stuff like this, you know, bad for your health. This was an event that was truly a speed event. And it was equal to the machineries of oppression during these events, or policing. And that is, the event didn't have a center at all. Uh, people uh, came from everywhere, it seemed. And they were all sort of dressed up in sort of very theatrical costumes. Some people, you know, Disneyland costumes, other fairy queen costumes, just suddenly all these delirious creatures appear in the streets of Montreal. And they're all carrying signs you know, against poverty and homelessness and things. But they don't have a point of congregation. There's somebody suddenly like a swarm and they congregate. And it caught the Montreal police off guard completely. Because rather than stay in one intersection and block traffic, they then move very fast from intersection to intersection in a very kind of erratic kind of way. And just watching it, I say, well, I see the, the forces of policing were completely confused. And I could hear the Police saying to one, where are they going now? What are they doing? Because they had sort of like, you know, really caught on to the language that in a speed culture, you meet it with speed. And in a culture which is delirious in its logic, as the French theorist Jean Baudrillard would say, you create delirious protest. Is that what they were doing with the cyborgs? Yeah, well, they were, they were trying to, they were 
in Donna Haraway's sense, yes, because they were, they were not going outside the logic within which they lived. They were simply, you know, creatively trying to use the logic to find, be ironic, to find different paths, to open up different spaces of resistance itself. So Fluidity. So it's like we're just a technological notion of a technological being as opposed to renounce technology with a pious degree, becoming techno technological being to know? I wouldn't say that. Because the, the, well, the, I mean, the Santa Claus people who were oh, yeah, no, no, that's, consumption that's and, true. and the people who were lobbying for poverty and anti this con consumeristic technological society but those become the easiest to be a technological being, i.e. cyber. Yeah, but those cyborgs are probably all computer, pro computer programmers or hackers in Silicon Valley because they just sort of flip, right? I mean, uh, you know, friends of mine in California will be CEOs of you know, very, very advanced multimedia companies and hot, really hotshot companies in, in uh, San Francisco and working for Microsoft one minute. But you turn your eye and next thing they're living in basements in Paris and going to, you're getting emails from them, they're in the Parisian catacombs and they've completely renounced that way of life and they've gone onto something else. Well, that I think is Donna Harvey's notion of a cyborg. She says, well, I have a fixed identity in advance. Why not have an identity that's more porous and fluid and doesn't renounce things in advance either. It's sort of a sense to things. I mean, why can't you be a hacker and be, as hackers are, incredibly creative? Why can't you be a woman, be incredibly versed in technologies, as a lot of people I know are, and at the same time have a real sense of concern about poverty and homelessness, fractured identities and workspace and colonization? I mean, why can't you be contradictory? Silly thing. Okay. Having a hard time being a cyborg myself. The um, do you think that's true? <laughs> well, that wouldn't be. I mean, there are some politicians that would be true, like in, in, in the Canadian Parliament. How many cyborgs are in the Canadian Parliament these days? Yeah, in this kind of doubled way. Well, that's true. So really maybe what she's saying, maybe your very good point is, the notion of a cyborg then really comes out of a much more ancient form of political resistance. Do you think there's anything about the situation in which we live that would make her argument, you know, like sort of singular about the culture in which we live? I'm sorry? Do you think there's anything about her conception of a cyborg that would make it sort of original to the culture in which we live? Well, what about her notion of an informatics of domination? Mm -hmm. the key. I don't know. I really think, I mean, that, that, okay, again, as I understand that, that's essentially saying that a very old in communication studies, anyway, thought that people are putting forth information which becomes the general understanding of the public and they bounce back and it's kind of like there's been a feedback loop. Yeah. Is how I understood it, which, I mean, I'm in communications, we've been studying that like the past few years of, of things that people have been historically. So again, I don't think that's anything very new. Yeah, but what if a cyborg begins not with a communication system, but with the end of communications? Sorry, <laughs> oh, I know. Well, it's a paradox, eh? <laughs> 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 
No, but what if a what if her notion of a cyborg doesn't begin with a communication system, but with the end of communications? Like she's. Is it right to say that her notion of a cyborg though begins everything that everyone ever understood about what a cyborg is no, until no, that day? No, 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 no. But I thought a cyborg huh? was a hybrid of man and machine, human and machine. Animals too. Animals are hu human. I mean, we saw. Yeah, like after Darwin, you can have, there are hybrids among us. Okay, but it seems like a simplistic, but also a completely right on death. Is, is a cyborg not just a hybrid of humans and a, a organic I being? I think you can understand it like in that kind of scientific, purely scientific way, like, you know, an integration of like flesh and metal, or you can understand it like within the idea of like how we understand everything that we're involved in. Like, if we, like we've been talking about, we, there's abstract ways that technology is, is sort of implicated in our lives. I think that mainly the sort of cyborg manifesto, like the, the, she's talking about every single way that you feel that you're in, implicated with technology, there's a way that your human side is capable of being irrational and subverting that, you know? I, I find that when I read this, it's like she, the informatics of domin domination is all about systems, which are sort of logical systems, the, the, the transition from older traditional systems to very logical um, automated systems. And we still have, as cyborgs, the capability to use these tools as well as our sort of human irrationality and our human uh, ingenuity to like, you know, find ways of, you know, staying on top of things, staying just above those systems. Like, like the protesters moving around faster than police could understand them. Like they're not expecting you to act irrationally on this. They're expecting you to add, act in a herd mentality and it's like, Cyborgs are like by their very nature can be individuals. Like I think that's the main point. I don't know. I don't know if I said anything there, but <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very vote of confidence at the end of a great at the end of a great statement. No, that's really good. I mean, the, all these perspectives are really good. Just a second question. I'm not sure if you said anything there. I <laughs> Oh, so cruel, so cruel. No, I'm not sure if I said anything. I'm not, it's not, it's not no, no, it's, these are really, no, they're really great ways of sort of trying to open up what she means by a cyborg and whether it identifies. Can I go back to the thing about the end of communication, though? Because I don't want to put words into <laughs> Harway's mouth, but what I would say, having you know, thought about what she has said, is that cyborgs really begin with the end of communications. Because you can't have a cyborg consciousness if you think that communications go on anymore. I mean, communications mean, in a very primal sense, meaningful exchanges of information. Some dialogue takes place. There's human reflexivity. Communication systems that we live in seek to destroy that. I mean, the French thinker, Jean Baudrillard, I believe was really correct when he says that communication systems that we live in are monological. That is, they scream, we listen. When was the last time any of you participated meaningfully in one of these mass, in the mass media. One of my experiences is on very rare occasions itself. But I'm always exposed to media. I'm always having mass massaging of opinion washing over me all the time. I always have to try to make up my mind on public events on the basis of absolutely incomplete information. I've always have to try to say, okay, what's propaganda? What's ideology? Are there any facts here at all in some things like this? And most things can't make up your mind at all. So I think the notion of a cyborg doesn't begin with communications at all. The cyborg in an informatics of domination begins with a culture, which is not a communication culture, though likes to say that's what it is, and it's not an information culture. It's a culture as an end of communications. It's a culture of an end of information in any meaningful sense of the term, except when information is really related to power. And a cyborg perspective would be both to experience that and then to ask the question, well, how in a system of like random flows of information, how do you make up your own mind? How do you do something very traditional and very classical? How do you have a mind of your own? How do you really begin to sift through the facts? And I think you know, that that's really the challenge of living in technological society. And a lot of students have actually figured this out. Like, you know, the, the anti-globalization movement doesn't only accidentally come out of student culture comes out of student cultures because students have really, by and large around the world, have figured out how to navigate you know, really conflicting systems of information. And they have begun to tell the stories in anti-globalization protests of a story that would not be told, of another story of events itself. I mean, would there be any changes in child labor laws if it wasn't for 
students telling another story about child labor practices itself? Would there be another story of globalization told without students telling the story that would not be told? I mean, students are, in Donna Haraway's sense, navigators. You know, they're navigators of a new terrain. And the anti-globalization movement takes place using very sophisticated forms of communication that are as sophisticated as their opposition itself, which drives like, you know, the, you know, the, the systems of power pretty crazy, actually, to the point where you go to Quebec City as friends of mine, and maybe some of you have, and, you know, you don't even get crowd control anymore. You just get gassed. You get two days of just gassing. You get cops with tear gas lobbing it over, you know, just really cruel and really intended to dissuade communication, dissuade just democracy itself. And I think that Haraway would say that people in these protests are in a meaningful sense cyborgs because they're looking for forms of identity and forms of meaning that are more porous and fluid and more impossible than the system is going to deliver. And so I don't think she goes back to holism. I think she just holds things in tension in some ways. I think that's what she's trying to do in here. Ted, did you have your hand up? Well, yeah, I don't know if this might be an oversimplification, um, but it, just, it seems to me that there might be a difference between um, being a cyborg and recognizing that you're a cyborg in, mm. in Haraway's article. And um, again, I mean, I might be oversimplifying, but I read it through the Landsberg article on prosthetic memory. And I think, well, okay, a cyborg, you know, visually has this sort of